Good evening, everybody. So I'm Krish, and I look after our jellyfish and our corals at the Two Oceans Aquarium. Um, and I would just like to thank um, the jelly team for all the assistance and the help and helping to grow the animals at work, helping me study them, as well as Ethan that really helped me finish this presentation today. And Helen, especially for your beautiful images that you allowed me to use in this presentation. Um, so I work at the aquarium. I've been working here since 2016 and I've been working with jellyfish since 2012. So I've been working there for them for a very, very, very long time. And I think jellyfish are the most stunning and interesting animals that I've ever come across, if I can put it that way. So everybody loves cute animals. People come to the aquarium to come see penguins and pufferfish, and octopus, and everything is basically cute, but jellyfish are exceptionally, exceptionally beautiful. I've never seen anybody come to the aquarium and sit for hours and hours watching a penguin or fish from around, but I've seen school kids literally sit around our jellyfish cylinders, just mesmerized at how they swing. I recently mentioned to, to somebody that I literally saw a couple for more than five hours just stay in our jelly gallery um, on one of the ottomans, just sitting and watching the animals swing, swimming, swimming past. So, some animals are cute, but jellyfish are not beautiful, but completely stunning. Um, and the video you just saw now was just some of our compass jellyfish that we get to work with um, here at the aquarium. So jellyfish are very, very interesting. They have this um, sack body plant. So if you guys want to think of a plastic bag, it's basically just a sack with one opening going in and one going out. And generally jellyfish have that body plant and then they have tentacles around the open edge. So what all these animals have in common are stinging cells, nidomes, and that's why we call them cnidarians. And jellyfish and anemones and even coral fall into this group because they all have these stinging cells that we'll touch on a bit later. But that's basically what defines this group um, amongst everything. This is an oversimplified picture. Um, and you can basically just see that the polyp or the anemone is basically just an upside down version um, of a jellyfish when it swims around. Um, and they work precisely the same. Um, jellyfish are not generally very complex. Most people think of them as being completely brainless, but they do have a nerve network that allows them to pulse and swim. They can sense food in the water. Um, jellyfish actually hunt for food, both box jellyfish and real jellyfish, as much as penguins and dolphins hunt for food, believe it or not, even though they don't have brains. Um, but the main organ the jellyfish uses to sense um, its world is basically this organism or its organ over here. It's called the ropalium. And basically, this is the jellyfish's ear and its eye. And basically, this tells the jellyfish if it's the right way up or whether it's day or nighttime because they can actually sense light. But in box jellyfish, it's completely way, way, way more advanced. So this is a box jellyfish or sea wasp. Um, the scientific name is Chironotex flickeri, and it's swimming around in a mangrove forest. And you can basically see that even though this jellyfish doesn't have a brain, it's not swimming into any roots at all. It actually dodges and moves between roots. We know now that box jellyfish can actually distinguish shapes and all box jellyfish have brown eyes and they've got something very similar to the brain network. Um, and we also do know that jellyfish sleep. If you guys come to the aquarium, you'll be able to see that as soon as box jellyfish are full, they're like us on a Christmas day, belly is full, eyes closed, and they'll be laying on the floor of the tanks basically sleeping aiding in the digestion of their food. So let's put some things into perspective. So jellyfish are huge. They can be gigantinormous. Um, the jellyfish in the video that's playing at the moment is a battle jellyfish, um, Rhizostoma pumo. And um, jellyfish have normally have tentacles that also trail behind them. And that makes them some of the longest animals in the world because they actually use those tentacles like fishing lines covered in octaves to fish for food and actually pull it close into their mouth so they can digest it. So blue whales are just about 30 meters long, but blue bottles as well as, um, as, well as um, lion's mane jellyfish actually eclipse the size of a blue whale completely being more than 36 meters long. That's way bigger than any recorded blue whale. So it's just a little video to show you guys 
how efficient and beautiful jellies are as killers. So they're basically beautiful killers. Blue bottles have this gas filled bladder with a membrane at the top of it that acts as a stale, keeping the blue bottle on course as it goes through the waves. Below the blue bottle, there are lots and lots and lots of tentacles, and these tentacles are thin, thread-like protrusions, very similar to here. So while it floats in the water, it practically looks invisible. And along these tentacles, there are lots of tiny stinging cells that have these nematocysts that sting and catch the jelly's prey. When the fish is caught, the blue bottle pulls it in like a fisherman will pull in a fishing line to its digestive organs that, that are situated below this bell. And partially part of the poison that is injected by the, the tentacles of the blue bottle, it not only paralyzes and kills the prey, but it also starts digesting the prey as well. And so basically when the blue bottle starts absorbing its prey, it's practically drinking a fish milkshake. Um, as the fish integrates, disintegrates, and the blue bottle absorbs it as food. So that was just to show you why fish jellies are at catching food. And one of the things that actually helps them um, is the fact that they are so diverse. There are so many body shapes. Um, there are so many sizes to them. They can live in fresh water. They can live in warm water. They can live in Arctic water. So they basically conquered every water body in the world. Um, and exploited it and they are very 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 good predators so this is just another picture to show you what i referred to earlier when i was trying to size up and show you what the longest animals are um, in the ocean itself so it's just a little little infograph showing that so the longest animals in the ocean actually grow from these little guys called polyps and so they're small anemones and this is a one rand queen you can see how many of them we could actually scatter on that one rand queen just to give you some the scale to the size. So let's touch on jellyfish stings quickly. So jelly stings are basically harpoons within a thread. And so you'll see there are little hairs at each end of each capsule. And that hair actually, it's triggered according to the jellyfish. So if a prey comes past, if it's a, a shrimp or a fish, because that shrimp or fish doesn't have the same um, slime or texture on its body, it will actually get that hair to be triggered and fired off. That's why you can have lots of jellyfish in the same tank. It doesn't really sting each other. And that's why when you have a jellyfish that eats another jellyfish, as soon as they sense that difference, they'll follow off, they'll fire off these harpoons. And as soon as these little needles are injected into their prey, the venom starts pumping out. The venom is actually potassium based. So all that means is it actually short circuits your cells. So if somebody says that a jellyfish shocks you, technically they are correct in saying that. So if we think back to the video we just watched with the blue bottle, the ocean is vast, open. It's technically sometimes can be referred to as a desert if you want to find food. And a blue bottle doesn't know when it's gonna come in contact with any food. So it needs to have a very potent venom in order to make sure that it's going to stop its brain its tracks because it doesn't know when it's going to come into contact with food again. So what happens is the fish will kind of, kind of find refuge under this floating um, organism in the ocean and actually get stung. The venom is so potent that it actually stops the fish's heart in a contact state, allowing the fish or the jellyfish to then pull up the fish in order to start digesting it, basically. What we do know is that bicarbonate of soda, even dry spice, is very efficient at neutralizing jellyfish stings. Vinegar as well. And so what we actually need to do is when you get stung by jellies is to actually use one of those components and to take a flat card, a bank card of some kind and actually scrape the cells off your arm before the rest of them can actually be triggered or pressed to fire um, as you guys saw in that video. Um, peeing is not a good idea uh, because actually sometimes we call it the osmotic potential, but basically just the difference in the amount of solutes diluted in the water can actually cause more of the stings to fire. Uh, the only time in my mind where, we, where it would be okay for you to use fresh water is when you're using hot fresh water. That is because the proteins that actually make you feel pain start melting and changing shape 
stopping making you feel pain at about 50 degrees Celsius. So if you can put your arm <laughs> under very hot water while you're running a tap, even though the steam cells will fire because of the osmotic difference, you won't be able to feel the pain. And whatever is causing you pain at that time will actually change shape and you won't be able to feel that pain that much anymore. Using a topical cream, um, like something with aloe or anything that's an antihistamine will then help bring down the swelling or the itchiness that you will feel from the, from the sting itself. It's also good to know that if you're allergic to bees, that you should also not mess around with any kind of jellyfish because that is just uh, a worsening situation for, for your body to deal with. Moon jellies begin their lives as tiny polyps anchored to the seafloor. They are ghostly forms of life, no larger than the tip of a pencil. In fact, just a few times each year, moon jellies undergo one of the most fantastic transformations in the animal kingdom. At some point, those polyps, they'll begin to divide. And it's almost like they form little plates, one on top of each other. Each polyp forms dozens of orange plates. Each plate in turn becomes a single animal called an ephyra. The ephyra can be considered the juvenile jellyfish stage. Each of which breaks off from the pulp stem and swims away. Over the course of a month, the juvenile jellyfish feed on plankton as they develop into adults. Fully grown, they can reach nearly two feet in width. When they spawn, these jellyfish gather in massive swarms near the coast. Males cast threads of sperm into the water. Collecting the threads with their frilly arms, females capture and ingest the sperm, which then fertilize their eggs. But their offspring will take root as tiny polyps and start the cycle anew. So over here, when we see these polyp beds, those little animals are actually clones of one another. So polyps are either boys or girls, and then they give us boy jellyfish or girl jellyfish. But usually what happens is there'll be one individual and he literally clones himself. He makes a, a direct genetic copy of himself. So in theory, if he cloned all of these individuals on this rock, if a nudibranch comes and comes to eat all of them and there's one left, it's still the same individual that was around in the beginning, so to say. That's why we can consider polyps to be Another thing is, if the temperature gets too hot or the temperature gets too cold, the same polyp can then form a scar, similar to how you will get a scar when you get injured. And that scar can stay dormant for many, many years. When the conditions become very favorable, the polyp comes back to life and basically forms this body plan again of a little anemone and then clones himself over and over again. And that cycle can be repeated over and over and over and over and over. Basically, as long as you've got this polyp, you basically have the jellyfish. And that's what we like to say that they work like fruit trees, just like if you have an apple tree at your house, as long as you have an apple tree, you can get those apples. As long as you have this polyp, 
you will have that jellyfish basically. And that's why they are basically like the cockroaches of the ocean, if I can put it that way. So this is a picture representing um, what we just saw in that video. The eggs and sperm forming this little planula that looks like a little fuzzy tic tac sweet swimming around that forms the polyp that then turns into this jellyfish. Um, the same thing happens with the immortal jellyfish, but what's different is the immortal jellyfish itself can turn back into a little polyp when it gets damaged to it. That's basically like us turning back into a baby um, and then starting life all the way from the start again. So jellyfish life cycles have many stages, as you guys have seen, and the easiest way I can explain it to you is it's like a butterfly. So butterflies also have a very complex life cycle, but when we simplify it, we've got these three main stages. We've got the polyp, we've got the strobili, giving us the baby jellyfish, those little snowflake thingies swimming around, and then we have the jellyfish, male and female, that can give us the polyps again. That's in most jellyfish cases. There are exceptions to the rules, but that's generally what happens. And so we can match them up. The polyp is similar to the caterpillar, the strobili, the transformation that happens is very similar to a cocoon or a chrysalis. And then we have a butterfly, which is the jellyfish that then swims around the ocean and basically spreads its genetic material and the possibility of settling more polyps so that the colonies can move along the coastline wherever the jellyfish swam. So the important and the impact of jellyfish. So jellyfish are actually food, not just for human beings, um, in the north of Europe, they very interestingly dry jellyfish in different um, gins, making them into jellyfish crisps. And so the jellyfish takes on the flavor of, of that crisp. Um, but in Asia, lots of people eat jellyfish. They say it has a nice crunchy texture because they dry the jellyfish out. So that's a very, very popular um, meal. But Penguins are also dependent on jellyfish, especially in the Arctic when fish are not available. There are lots of video footage of penguins going continuously for the gonads of the jellyfish, which are the most nutritious because that's where the jellyfish actually keeps its reproductive organs in order to make new little polyps. Uh, we know that sunfish and sharks eat them as well. And the time when they appear in very large numbers seasonally in a, in a healthy environment is actually a very good um, period of time where high volume of food is introduced. So lots of animals can depend on that food source um, during that period for themselves to reproduce. So they're very good at um, becoming a food source and filling a gap or a niche um, seasonally so that other animals actually depend on them and actually anticipate that food source thriving. Jellies are also exceptional indicator species. So we'll touch on this now. But when overfishing happens or there's too much construction in an area, lots of man-made construction, lots of jellyfish start appearing sooner or later, basically because the jellyfish can settle on anything that's hard. So if you build a harbor, if you build a platform for yachts to tie to, the jellyfish can settle on those hard surfaces. Even if it's a fishing, um, even if it's a, a fishing pen for fish to be farmed in, those polyps can settle on that. And when they give a baby jellyfish, they can actually sting the fish growing in, in those pens and cause a lot of damage. So we have a very interesting example of our coastline. In the 1970s, um, fishing was basically allowed if you had a fishing vessel, especially in the northern Venezuela, um, which is here in Namibia. So we think Valpas Bay, we think Luderitz. And so as long as you had a fishing vessel, you could catch fish here. And it was one of the, the biggest, greatest fishery because a process called upwelling happens here. That's when nutrients from the bottom of the ocean is injected into the surface waters where plankton can grow. Um, and then little organisms like copepods and other small crabs and things can consume those food and the fish can come along and basically eat those copepods. And so we can think of um, sardines, hakes, poached, or mackerel, all of those fish are very well supported all along this coast because the Benguela is one of the, the most intense um, production currents um, comparatively around the world. And so because everybody could catch fish, they removed lots and lots of fish um, from the ecosystem. And there weren't enough fish left at the right, and, and at the right ages as well to reproduce, to make new colonies and stronger colonies going forward. So the fish were removed, but the fish's food, the copepods, and the other crab plankton was still left behind, um, but there was basically nothing to eat them. 
And so in the early 1970s, we started seeing more and more and more jellyfish appearing, um, up in Namibia or of Balfour's Bay and So much so with the last research done, for every 3.8 million tons of fin fish, that's your hake, sardines, orchards, there's actually 13.8 million tons of jellyfish all year around in Namibia. What's quite funny is, in South Africa, we started paying attention to this trend happening on that side, and we started putting fisheries quotas into place. So we controlled the amount of fish we would take out of the water so that the fish as adults can still persist, they can breed, make more eggs, make more babies, so that they can actually be in our waters for as long as they're supposed to be. We definitely see seasonally, especially in summer, as summer comes on and in winter, the jellyfish populations increase, but then as soon as the season ends, the jellyfish populations decrease, basically, because the fish keep the jellyfish in check. In Namibia, however, um, that process cannot happen because the jellyfish basically eats most of the fish that's breeding, the fish's eggs, the fish's babies, and the fish's food, keeping a negative pressure on that ecosystem. And in this video I'm showing you here is basically, I think it was in 2019, the straw happened and they caught almost eight tons of jellyfish. And you can see over here, they only caught one snook in that entire trawl. So it's a complete waste. And the problem is besides the jellyfish stinging the fish that gets caught in the net, so they can't, you can't use those fish, the jellyfish are also much heavier because they're basically 96% water. So most of the time they also tear these fishing nets. And so people have to spend a lot of money fixing the nets or you lose time and work. So there are very, very, very big problem up there um, in the Benguela. And that's also why we wanted to start understanding what kind of jellyfish they are and what do they do and how long do they live? So we can try and quantify and understand why are there so many of them swimming around in Namibia for the entire year? We also had jellyfish affect um, South Africa directly. Um, as early as 2005, jellyfish clogged up Kuburg. And basically, from my understanding, um, the kind of material jellyfish is, the more they are warmed up, the more heat they go give off, so to say. And that's not a very, very smart idea. If you have a nuclear power cell that uses cold seawater to cool itself down, and now you're adding something that's jelly-like that actually heats itself up more when, you, when it's surrounded by, by, by other heat objects. So as early as 2005, this happened. Um, and as recently as you can see, 13th of March, 2020. And so Kuburg actually really spurred most of the research for jellyfish, especially campus jellyfish on our coastline, because they wanted to try and predict when these jellyfish blooms happen so they can actually shut down their cooling intake systems so that they don't end up with a problem um, like this. Jellyfish are also very good at, at assisting in mixing the oceans especially if you think of the swarms and swarms and swarms of jellyfish that appear, there are hundreds and thousands of animals seasonally occurring in the water. And you can see from this video, just by the jellyfish swimming, um, how much water is actually mixed. The jellyfish pulses, it then moves the food through its lips at the back or through its tentacles, depending on the kind of jellyfish. And so whenever they swim, they're actually eating. And scientists have actually found that it's one of the most efficient ways of moving through the ocean without losing energy. So they, they're exceptionally, exceptionally great. Jellies has also helped us very easily identify genes that give people problems, um, as well as cancer, um, as well as um, situations where people might be sick um, by getting the genes from a jellyfish that we call the crystal jellyfish. You'll see them often on our coastline, um, washing up as well. And so this jellyfish actually has something called the green fluorescent protein that scientists um, in the early 1960s have taken from the jellyfish. They saw that this green fluorescent protein actually fluoresces green under blue light, as you can see in the jellyfish here at the aquarium. And so they implanted that in organisms, in cancer cells, um, in animals that are predispositioned to um, bad genetic shortcomings. And so as soon as that gene is implanted, it acts as a fluorescent marker for if something has cancer, so you can find cancer very easily in the body, or if something has an unwanted gene they don't want. So allowing you to easily separate the wanted from the unwanted. And yeah, it's been, it's been really fantastic. 
Jellyfish are also very, very, very important in closing the nutrient cycle or the carbon cycle in the ocean. Um, the version of um, antelope in the ocean are these little organisms called copepods. There are millions and millions and millions of them. Um, somebody um, wrote in one of the research papers that this is actually the greatest migration that happens every single day, much greater than any reindeer in the Northern Hemisphere or any wildebeest on the African plains, because these trillions of organisms all around the ocean swim towards the sun in the daytime, and in the evening, they swim away into the bottom of the ocean, away from predators, basically. And that is because they consume the phytoplankton, which is basically like the grass plains of the ocean. I explained upwelling earlier where the nutrients is sucked from the bottom of the ocean. That's basically the fertilizer. And these plants or algae grow on this fertilizer. The copepods then in turn eat this algae, and the jellyfish is actually one of the biggest predators. Like I said, as the jellyfish move through the water, they're actually consuming the food. And when the jellyfish die six months, eight months time, they actually return all of the nutrients back to the bottom of the ocean so that it can actually be sucked up again next season um, when the winds return for upwelling. So South Africa has a very small coastline of about 2,700 kilometers squared, and for that coastline, we have the highest diversity of jellies in the world, greater than the giant continent of America or Australia. Um, and so we actually have about 15%, even more, of the world's Caicomedusa species. Those are true jellyfish. Um, if you think of an umbrella with a stalk, that's true jellyfish. So we represent about 15% of the world's species right here on our coastline. We know we have about 25 different species that are endemic. Um, only found here and nowhere else in the world. And so, and that's partially due to this intense current that's on our coastline. Um, the Agalas current bringing warm water and the Benguela bringing cold water. And these currents mixing in between Cape Town and Mossel Bay, so to say, um, creating different niches for lots of different species along our coastline. Um, and jellyfish have been very great at exploiting both warm and cold water and even the rivers along our coastline. Um, in 2017, we tried to celebrate our jellyfish heritage, and the SA Postal Office actually made jellyfish stamps. Um, and that's actually, for the, for the first time, we actually got to make common names for all the scientific names of jellies that we actually um, find along our coastline that was described up until that time. So one of our biggest problems was that a lot of other scientists from other countries has decided what species we have on our coast when we have not had the time to actually look at the jellyfish ourselves. These are the three compass jellyfish species found on our coastline. They are called the Cape Compass jellyfish, Chrysoora agaliensis, very recently described, even though we have pictures um, and records of it going very, very far back. And I'll show you guys just now why it was only recently properly described. We have Chrysoora africana and we have Chrysoora um, pugida. Those are the three species. I'm going to try just briefly separate the three from each other. This is a jellyfish you'll see wash up mostly um, along Cape Town. And this is a jellyfish you'll see wash up mostly in, along Langaban area. So the Cape Compass jellyfish have these beautiful purpose compass marks on their heads. And if you look at them up close, it looks like they've got white freckles spread across their heads. They've got flat white tentacles. And they've got very, very short lips or auto arms. It basically looks like, like frills, if we put it that way. We have Chrysoora africana. Instead of having frilly lips, they've got very flat paddle-like lips. And between each triangle, there's actually a line drawn in between each one. And they've got purple tentacles. Lastly, we've got Chrysoora fugida. And only in 2014, 2013, 2014, we actually got to grow them in the lab for the first time since we started looking them at them about around about 1996, I think. Um, we could actually see that this jellyfish is actually not three different kinds, but one jellyfish at different parts of its life stage. Depending on how old the jellyfish is, the jellyfish goes through a transformation. It normally has this pink color, normally with white lips, then it becomes more um, salmon pink, orange in color, so you get this red jellyfish. In Namibia, they call them red jellies. At this stage, they are very big. Their umbrellas can be between 80 centimeters and a meter, and they can have lips or, or arms more than two to three meters long, and it's a very, very fluffy. 
this jellyfish loses most of its tentacles because its food source is usually fish eggs. So it doesn't really need to have its tentacles because it literally just has these giant mops that just filter the water as it passes or swims through it, making it one of the most efficient eaters and allowing it to assist in keeping that negative pressure on the ecosystem in Namibia. All three of these species occur on our coastline. And you can see if you don't really care about jellyfish, you don't really spot the differences very, very easily. But once you actually sit down and you actually pay attention, you can actually see that they're all different. Originally in science, we all refer to all three of these species as this species. This is Chrysoora hysacella from the UK, not from Africa, not close. You can see it's brown in color. It does look very similar to the Cape Compass jellyfish, but it has this little dot in the middle of its head. But just because something had stripes, it was considered to be this. And so with genetics and with morphology, looking at the number of tentacles, looking at the shape of the lips of the animal, we know that we have these three species endemic to our coast and they are found nowhere else in the world. Um, we also have these jellyfish, we call them rhizostomes. Rhizostomes are jellies that have eight lips or more around them, but characteristically, they don't have tentacles around their bell. They are very fleeting. We don't have a chance to work with them. A lot of you guys will see these jellyfish at the moment when you are near Durban. We call them the St. Lucia jellyfish. They look like they've got stitching around their bell, and they basically, I call it, it's going to sound creepy, but I call it toenails. They've got toenails at the end of their lips. Um, and then in every river from the Breda River up, we've got these jellies. You can see they don't have this flat marking at the end, and they've got no stitching around the bell. We call them blubber jellies. They literally live in the rivers of our coast. Um, if you go to Kirbom's rivers, there should be a population there now as well. So we have a lot of animals we still need to work with and describe. And it doesn't mean that this species looks like a species found somewhere, somewhere else that it is that species. We know that when we actually do compare the genetics, that we have completely different species to other species found that look very similar. There's also lots of jellies that we don't know of. We call this jellyfish Barrowicucumus, but when you actually look at the description of Barrowicucumus, this jellyfish doesn't actually meet the description. So this still needs to be studied. We've got, we've got lobed tenophores, because this group of jellies are called tenophores because they're not really jellyfish. Um, and we know of one big group of lobed tenophores called Mimeopsis that cause problems, but we don't know anything about the lobed tenophores in our coastline. This is a very interesting jellyfish called the nightlight jellyfish. If you touch them, they also glow in the dark. They're quite cool. They're very small. And about two years ago, um, they went all the way up the coast of Mossel Bay, um, if I remember correctly. And what's very interesting about them is they breed as they go along in the ocean. They don't have a little anemone or polyp that actually makes the jellyfish. The male and the female releases the eggs and sperm and it transforms directly into a baby jellyfish. So wherever the current carries this population, the jellyfish population increases as it goes along the coastline. And then box jellyfish. We've only described two or three species on our coast. We've got the biggest box jellyfish in the world. It's called Chiridropus gorilla. And you can find it from Irlands by all the way to Namibia. And it's bigger than your pick and bay shopping bag, basically. It's, it's quite menacing if you have to see it in the ocean. But there are lots of box jellyfish in Durban and in between. Um, I've at least seen eight different kinds. And so we still need to actually see if they are as venomous um, as other box jellies or really, really not. Then some other jellies to mention. I mentioned the crystal jellyfish before because we got the, the green fluorescent protein from them, but lots of people confuse the crystal jellyfish with the moon jellyfish, and they are not related at all. This is something called a hydra medusa, which is something very different to a scaphid medusa, and I can get into the technical details, but a distinguishing feature would be that crystal jellies don't have these lips in the middle of them, and they've got these marks. These lines on their bodies actually where their gonads are. Whereas moon jellyfish have these four horseshoe shapes, and that is where the big owners actually are. We also have, um, oops, let's go back one more. We also have blue bottles on our coastline. We've been able to study blue bottles for at least two months at the aquarium, um, and they're very, very interesting animals. Um, the animal, instead of the little polyp making an identical clone of itself, the polyp actually clones 
the bubble that floats on top of the, the water, the reproductive organs, and then the tentacles and the feeding organs. So it's like one individual changing him into different body parts just so that they all can live together and feed together and share food amongst each other in order to be successful. Um, lots of you also have seen, if you were in Cape Town, these animals called siphonophores, they're in the same group as these three jellyfish. Um, and they have very, very painful stings. Because like I said, they live in the open ocean and they need to make sure that when they actually encounter food, they actually get to keep the food and eat it so they can reproduce and multiply. Then this is a new species of jellyfish. It's called Drymonema. We don't have the second part of its name yet, but it's a jellyfish that only eats other jellyfish. There are two other versions around the world that's restricted to warm water, one of Brazil and one in the Mediterranean. And they are very rare. The last few times they were seen was about, the one species was seen 70 years apart, and the other one was seen, I think, 10 or 15 years apart. And they're one of the most efficient jellyfish eating jellies in the world. They can eat up, eat up to 34 to 40 jellies at a single time. And they basically just melt and absorb the jellies and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, this is a picture of Southern Africa um, that won a National Geographic Prize. And you can see there's two cupless jellyfish. So cupless jellyfish eat other jellyfish and they probably thought to themselves, oh, here's a nice big jelly meal. But you can actually see that the pink mini is pulling them in and is going to eat and consume them. And you can actually see them trying to spin away um, as they're trying to escape the, the imminent death. And we actually have made really cool examples, uh, uh, observations that compass jellyfish in the lab and in the wild live for about six months. And the two times we got to work with the pink mini, it also lived for about six months. And so we can safely say that their life cycles are very much tied to each other because when Cape Campus jellyfish bloom in the, heart, in, the, in the ocean, they bloom in prolific amounts. You'll see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And as long as that food source is available, these jellyfish can basically stick around. We also are the only country in the world that have all three species of rhizostoma jellies. We've got rhizostoma pumo, um, which I'm sure lots of divers have seen along our coast, and which is also in a video that we saw earlier. We've got Rhizostoma octopus, um, basically um, also in our waters, and then a very popular jellyfish, Rhizostoma luteum. That is a jellyfish you normally see washing up on the beach, and they've got these four balls in their head um, as one of the distinguishing features. So growing jellies in captivity um, is quite uh, a trick to be done. Um, jellyfish require a lot of flow, Without any flow, they actually just lay on the floor. So jellyfish are so efficient. That's why when you open an umbrella and there's a wind, the umbrella will be dragged in that direction. Think of jellyfish the same way. Wherever the currents go, there the jellyfish go and the food of the jellyfish as well, which means that the jellyfish basically lives in a McDonald's drive through all the time, eating and swimming. And jellies have the perfect diet body. The more they eat, the bigger they grow. The less they eat, they basically just shrink down again. And so these are just some examples of where we keep our jellyfish in cylinders. We normally have the flow doing this to keep them suspended in water in a kreisel, which is a German word meaning roundabout. The flow normally moves in this way, um, allowing the jellyfish to swim up and past the window, swim up and past the window. So you're always seeing a jellyfish. And we need to make sure that the temperature is very well controlled. That's why we've got these chillers. They're basically fridges for water because if the water gets too warm or too cold, the jellyfish will basically um, invert like an umbrella in a storm. And if it, gets, if it gets inverted because it's too hot, then we can't save the jellyfish. They basically, they did. Um, and we normally share those jellies with turtles or other jellyfish um, that eat jellies here at the aquarium. But if a jellyfish inverts because the temperature is too cold because of shock, cold shock, there's a 50% chance sometimes we can bring them back again. Um, so we keep our polyps in these cereal containers. So you might have your, your catalogs in there, but we've got little baby jellyfish. And as the baby jellyfish are born, um, they are caught in these dishes. And then we grow them out in these beakers or bottles until they are the correct size. It takes us about a month to grow them. But working with the jellyfish um, behind the scenes, if it's a new species, it can take us any, way, any time from six months to a year before we know the most efficient diet for them the most efficient flow for them, the most efficient temperature for them. Because most of the time you just find these animals in the ocean, you go, oh, the water was 14 degrees Celsius. But you don't know if the 14 degrees Celsius was actually there 
for the entire time the jellyfish was there, or just because the current shifted into water it was slightly colder because of the welling. So we have to answer lots of questions before everybody actually gets to see one of our so African jellyfish on exhibit at the wedding. Thank you so much. I hope that was informative. Um, if you have any questions, you can contact me on my email. Um, I'm sure there'll be a question session after that. I just quickly asked the question from Tara McKinney. How long do jellyfish live? Are they? Same yeah. So jellyfish tend to live, uh, our shortest living jellies at the podium is six months. So we normally just grow those jellyfish for Christmas season. So we'll start um, June, July, August, and then they'll go and exhibit Christmas, because it, it takes two months to actually start looking like a jellyfish in the first place. Um, but normally they live for about nine months per year. And we have, have a few tricks up our sleeve to, in order to extend that lifespan with diet and temperature. And they work exactly like if somebody got you flowers, if your partner got you flowers, you've got beautiful flowers in your house for a week or two, and then they start expiring, you have to replace them. And that's how we're always culturing new ones in the lab. But since 2016, we actually have two or three jellyfish that are still alive. And so those are the longest jellyfish alive that we know of across the world. And those are the blubber jellies that you actually find in the rivers along our coastline. So the longest living jellyfish we know of at the moment is about six years old, um, but generally they live for a few months. Isn't there one that is like, um, I think I read somewhere, I can't remember the species name, that's immortal or immortal. That yes, keeps... so with, with, with the immortal jelly, what, what happens is if the adult jellyfish gets damaged or something tries to eat it, it turns back into the anemone, the polyp. Mm. That polyp clones itself and remakes okay. that same jellyfish again. That's, that's okay. how that immortality works. So it technically never dies, but even the polyps themselves are immortal. So every single version of jellyfish that we see swimming around in the ocean, sometimes they are from polyp beds that might be hundreds of years old that we don't know of. We can't really tell their age. Maybe somebody can do a research project on that. Um, but yeah. those polyp beds might be very old, they will inject jellies into the water column and those same individuals will swim past you in the ocean and they will settle somewhere else again. There's actually moon jellyfish species that act like they're mortal jellyfish and they can also turn back into a polyp again. So those moon jellyfish are definitely also immortal. Immortal, it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's ask Anna Shavar. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I have a uh, I have a question in regard to different species in the aquarium. How do they uh, go together? Can you keep uh, different species together or will they be parted? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So we can keep different species together. We've had um, upside down jellyfish live with other jellyfish. We also have two different campus jellyfish. The third campus jellyfish can actually live side by side with the Benguela campus jellyfish. So that's not really a problem. But where it does become a problem is when the jellyfish is below that jellyfish um, in um, taxonomy, because campus jellyfish are jellyfish that are top predators in the ecosystem, just like the pink mini jellyfish. So if other jellyfish are in the same tank as it is, and it's not the same kind, those jellyfish will actually become eaten, they'll get eaten. Um, so most of the time we don't keep different jellyfish with each other. There are some species that you can, um, but most of the time um, we keep them separately because there are jellies that can eat other jellyfish. Thank you. All right, and the next question is from Kim Scroder. I just wanted to know one of the biggest threats to jellyfish. Okay, so jellyfish don't really have really big threats. But what we can refer to as a threat to jellies, there are jellyfish in America called cannonball jellies that have been fished for years and years and years as food and exported um, to other countries. And in that same ocean, trawling also happens. So the, the beds are disturbed um, and as well as other chemical means um, are, are also flushed into that same water body. So what they've actually found that either the polyps have become very, very tired of changing into baby jellyfish, or the polar bears have been so disturbed that they can't recover very quickly to give the same amount of jellyfish. So in that water body of America, um, cannibal jellyfish has started becoming very, very, very rare, um, if I can put it that way. Um, 
Also, some jellyfish are just very good at predating on other species. So there are animals like, um, we call them nemeopsis, which are these rowy, like these jellies that look like they glitter in the water. Um, and they are very good threats to, 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 to other fish. And so if we overfish or we pollute the ocean um, and the phytoplankton can grow and the little organisms that eat the phytoplankton can grow, then we will have a 30 jellies because that's their food source and that's the way that they stick around. They might not appear for years and years and years, um, but then in a few years time when everything comes back slightly to normal, they might appear back. So it's just, I think our, our only threat would be um, the consistency we'll see jellies by, by impacting the environment. The stinging cells in their tentacles, I'm very interested in, in, in that. Are they kind of, um, once they've stung once, do they die or can they continue stinging? I mean, do they like get used up? Does the cell actually die as it stings? Are all the species the same or some different? Um, yeah, and I mean, some of those tentacles are like, well, I don't even know if you can call it a tentacle. It's a kind of stinging um, string thing. Um, they're like meters and meters long. So yeah, if you can just talk about that, I hope you didn't cover it earlier. No, no problem. So I remember bringing my, my niece, I think she was about four years old, the first time to the aquarium, and she saw a jellyfish with lots of tentacles, and she referred to it as hair. The jellyfish has long hair. So it's basically just trailing behind it, um, and it's very similar to Balcrove, okay? So the jellyfish that we know of with the most variety of stinging cells is the lion's mane jellyfish. That's also the longest jellyfish. That's the jellyfish that's like about 36 meters long, longer than the blue whale. And so that jellyfish has an armada, an entire armada of different stinging cells. Stinging cells for other jellyfish, stinging cells for shrimp, stinging cells for plankton, stinging cells for, they are the, they've got Swiss, they swim around with Swiss army knives basically. <laughs> and so um, as they swim through the ocean, the stinging cells have little hairs on them. And the little hair is the sensor that tells it, this is the prey that I'm looking for. And each hair is prey specific. So the hair gets triggered, the bob comes out, the venom gets ejected, and the bob also holds onto the prey just like Valkyrie would. And so the prey can be pulled in. And so those cells can be regenerated in a couple of hours. Even if the tentacles break off, um, we've had box jellyfish here sometimes getting entangled in each other, literally four to six hours, the tentacle exists there again. So you can imagine um, plankton are very nutritious, very high in protein, and jellies are basically 96% water most of the time. And so if you've got this hydrostatic skeleton of water, putting on new scaffolding is fairly easy because you're just filling in the gaps of before. So when the, when the cells are fired, they, they are given off, they are fired, they are used, but the jellyfish goes to work to make new ones very, very quickly because it's dependent on those food, on those, on those cells, to A, immobilize its food, B, to make sure that the food stays attached to its tentacles before it comes back to its mouth, so to say. Um, so yeah, they're very, very efficient at making sure that their knives and all their tools are sharp and always ready to go. Uh, if, if, they, yeah, no, uh, if, if they snap off, do, can they still sting or does it need to be collect, connected to the umbrella part? No, sting? no, no. Definitely can still sing, even if it's dried material, it can still sting because each stinging cell is in its own capsule. And that capsule is where it keeps its venom and everything else. So I'm sure you've seen a blue bottle laying on the beach yeah, and yeah. you're still in the long part and you still got stung. So those little capsules are still very, very much ready to fire. They, they are very ready batteries. So, so it's not, it's almost not controlled by the the, the, the mothership at the top there. Uh, oh, it is. It, it, so that part also. So jellyfish don't have a brain, but they sleep, they hunt, they dive to depths where they know prey will be available and they can relax. I, I was going to add another video to just show you how they fish. They can relax the tentacles in certain parts of the current where they think they will, will most likely be prey in that area. There's been lots of experiments that actually show that actually happening. So they're in full control of extending, it's, it's like having a, 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 a measuring tape. They fully um, um, relax it and then basically 
filter down and feel for food in that area and they can decide do I fire all or everything because there's a force as soon as something gets fired there's a force of where the jellyfish can tell weight or density if I can put it that way and depending mm -hmm. on the weight and density it needs to know how much it must hold on to this so it might have to fire more in order to make sure the bulk of sticks more before it comes in. That's why when you get stung by a blue bottle on your back, on your arm, it feels like it's pulling tight because it's trying to figure out what do I have here and can this try and get away. Hmm. And the biggest prey that it can eat, that's the last question, sorry. So I would think it would be other jellyfish. Um, there are jellyfish um, like um, battle jellies are like two, three meters big. Um, there's um, Roma Palima, um, what is it called? Those Nomura jellyfish um, in Asia. And they, they have like, they've got fried egg jellies and things like that that are jelly viviris that actually eat them and melt and consume them in, within themselves. Um, technically, if it's protein, the jellyfish can digest it. So if I had a horse and I blended it, the jellyfish could eat that too. Because um, we give the jellyfish different smoothies. So as long as it's, if it's protein-based, if it has blood, if it has plasma, the protein can start affecting it and start melting it down. That it will just take very long. <laughs> yeah, it will just take very long to do it. Thanks. It's so interesting. I must definitely go watch the video on YouTube. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that. And thanks no for, 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 for giving me and allowing me to ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think that answers Keegan Lee Adrianza's question as well in the chat. Um, but then a follow-up question by Deval Fenter Grobler, who would like his son, who's like, who'd like to know if he picked up a dead jelly, will it sting him? Okay, that was answered. And then do jellies lose their color when they die? Because every time he sees a dead jelly on the beach, they are white. Okay. So most of the time that's according to the kind of jellyfish. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the time it would be that. Um, but no, if, we, if somebody sends me a photograph of a, of a washed up jelly, even if it was boltonged from three or four days ago, I can still try and identify it by the color or the shape of the markings on it. So generally, they, they don't lose their color. But in Langaban area, there's a version of the Benguela compass jellyfish that's completely pale and opaque. I remember for the first time when I was there, I thought it was something completely different because even if the shape was longer, because its diet was basically just jellyfish for most of the time that it was growing, that its shape changed. So jellies are very plastic, and that's why lots of scientists don't want to use morphology to describe species, because they can just change shape just depending on the food. Even in the aquarium, we try and grow the jellyfish as close to how they will look in the wild. So when you are in the aquarium and you see the name, you go, oh, that's that. Um, whereas lots of other aquariums don't do that. My friends always say when they look at the jellyfish, ah, oh, they're not feeding them enough or whatever at another aquarium because you want them to look big and fluffy like they look in the ocean. Um, because yeah, like, like I said, they, they are completely gorgeous when they're swimming, aren't they fantastic? So I want them to look like they're supposed to be. I, I think everyone knows my, my motto over here at the aquarium is that animals must thrive, they mustn't survive. So they need to eat as well as they do in, in, in the ocean. So we feed them about seven or eight times a day. They get a smoothie in the morning with prawns and fish eggs and hake and mussels, black mussels, white mussels. They get shrimp and roti fizz fed three times a day, two to three liters of that. They get mysid shrimp. Um, if it's a jellyfish, they get fed other jellyfish. So we, they're in our care. So we need to make sure that they are going to be as well looked after, if not better, with substitutes than they would have had in the wild, even if we just have them for a few months and they're not technically a vertebrate, but I love my inverts. <laughs> <laughs> so can they, um, I know they're not fish, but can they ever be overfed? Or... So they are very, they're very good. They're not like, like me when I see cake and I just try and squeeze the 15th slice into my mouth. They actually drop their food um, and because the, their body is basically, like I tried to explain before, a sack, if nothing can fit in there, then it can be regurgitated. And they work very similar to a lot of um, reptiles and things of, if you mess with them too much, they actually drop and eject the food out of them in order to make themselves lighter so they can escape better. They also have a very good response. So sometimes they think we're going to catch them instead of feeding them with a turkey baster, and they literally will turn around and swim the opposite way. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a predator escape response that they still practice. So 
big smart even though they don't have yeah, brains. Yeah, they don't have brains. <laughs> yeah. And um, then a question from that I wanted to know before we go onto the chat again, um, the box jelly on our coach, coast, you said that they might be venomous. Mm -hmm. How are you going to find so, out? The so OJ is- You can use Ruan as a guinea pig if you want to. So we, we get some of them all the time. Um, we only through reports and through us work, I keep on forgetting what the unit is called. The unit that works with venom animals in South like in South Africa, if you get bitten with snake, you call them and report it or whatever. Um, we know of two people, um, one swimming in False Bay, and I can't remember what the other person was done, but they both had um, heart conditions before. And when they got stung by box jellyfish, they had severe arrhythmia, but they got to the hospital in time. So our box jellyfish venom doesn't have to be as potent as the ones in Australia. Um, and also our box jellies, the ones in Cape Town, the one species that's in most of the pictures, it's a swarming species. And we know they live for less than a year. Um, they disappear in June, July, it gets too cold for them and they reappear in August. So we know we know a lot about them, but they they this thing is as so as a wasp sting. Um, we've got volunteers that work with us now um, that when they've worked for years, um, even if you're just around the jellyfish in the water, you can wear gloves, but the jellies are still always giving off stinging cells in your face. So you'll, start, you'll feel that your face is glowing, like you've had a nice facial after a while. Um, but no, it's not, nobody has, I think blue bottles and box chilies have very intense venom because obviously box chilies, they physically hunt. If you come to the aquarium outside in the harbor, there are wild populations and there are lots of baby mullets. You physically, you will see the jellyfish change direction and swim after its prey. They will relax their tentacles to make like a net and they will chase the fish into it so they can get stung. Um, so it's marvelous to watch them. So our, our jellies aren't that venomous. Um, also maybe because we have so much food around being a cold upwelling area. So they don't really have to make sure that we, we stop our prey in our tracks, so to say. Um, but yeah, the jellies we do have, they, they stink sore like most jellies, but you don't have to worry about dying unless you have allergies for bees or you've got a heart condition or something like that because like i said it's mostly potassium based mm. um, but those box chilies are on the south coast no east coast east and south coast no, so we've got box chilies all along our coast all over yes so we we've only described two out of the eight or ten different kinds we have so <laughs> there's, there's, a lot to they? there's a lot to do in jelly science sorry what did you say are they like um how far are they how deep are they in the ocean I said they I mentioned now they're in the harbor right here. You can come watch them. Like outside the aquarium, you can watch them swimming around. That's okay. the closest. <laughs> sure. If you go swimming in False Bay, there's a probability you've been swimming past box jellies. You might have even swallowed a baby box jellyfish by accident. Oh, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Smiling sushi. <now. laughs> it's jelly sushi. Okay, but then there's a question. Um from Anna Shafar, um, the jellyfish with a pattern on the umbrella is called the ear jellyfish in the Baltic Sea. Are those Baltic Sea? Are those related? Yes, so all kinds of jellies are related. Three years ago, somebody did a paper um, comparing all of them and how they're related and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But that group, we call them Chrysler Order. If you guys want to go read a fun story about mythology, you can actually go read how Medusa gave birth to. Um, Cassiopeia, which gave birth to Andromeda, which gave birth to Chrysler Order, via, via, via. Um, and that's where we got most of our jellyfish names from, from Greek mythology, actually. So it's a really interesting story to go and read. And so Chrysler Order is the group of jellyfish where you think of it as an umbrella, it has those marks, and it has tentacles. And that's the jellyfish most people get tattoos of as well, basically, when they get a tattoo of a jellyfish. So Chrysler Order is a very distinct, if you think of a jellyfish, you think Chrysler Order. So yeah, they all have those compass marks on the head. Even if it's faint, it exists there. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, I was actually watching YouTube this morning, doing research for tonight, and Medusa came on as a video, and okay. now I know why. <laughs> as a follow-up video. <laughs> Great grandmother. <laughs> oh, I had the story this morning. Um, okay, then there's one more question from um, Keegan Lee Ariansa. I suppose that you can touch a jellyfish on the umbrella section and stay away from the tentacles. Mm -hmm. But the umbrella section also has stinging cells, not as oh, potent. Wow. Um, the most potent ones are in the tentacles, but when the jellyfish move through the water, 
they also want immobilized spray that's touching them. And so when they pulse, they flick that water into the, into, onto their lips and they rub it into their mouths. So any surface where they can sting and immobilize spray, they use. They, they use. use it. And their lips are just there for greater surface area so they can keep more prey. So there's more food on the conveyor belt on its way to its mouth, basically. Okay. Um, then also, um, Claudia Roth says, a friend of mine does research on sea turtles. Sea turtles eat lots of jellyfish. How do they avoid the nettle cells? So the sea turtles, if you look at turtles, they've got a beak. So because they have a hard beak, they don't really get in contact with the stinging cells. Even in their mouth, the way the mouth is shaped and their tongue, it's very rough in the inside. And they also have a different set of I don't want to get too technical, but a squamous layer in the inside of their mouth. So they don't really feel, feel the stings. I mean, turtles eat anemones and corals, and that's already intense as well. Um, so I always like to say that there aren't enough turtles and sunfish and whatever in the ocean to even make an impact on the population of jellyfish, because there's just so many and there's so little of them. And even if they did eat them, when they ate them, they stressed them. So the jellyfish gave off sperm and eggs to make more polyps. So it's basically, what's his name? Deadpool all the time, revenge, revenge, jellyfish karma. You try to kill me, I'm coming back to you next time. Don't worry. Okay. Then <laughs> Can I quickly come in, please? Hey, Chris, yes. Hi, Hi Chris. <laughs> uh, Chris, I unfortunately have to exit now. Okay. Thank you for a lovely talk. So you, informative, Pat. really enjoyed it. Thanks to Sandra for the poem. Thanks to Aisha and uh, Ruan for hosting. Aisha, you are full time appointed now. Very oh, clear thank that you, you are promotion. good at that. <laughs> and thanks for that. And Alistair, good to see you back on. And everybody else, thank you. Lovely to have you on. Unfortunately, I have to leave now. Good and evening. thanks to all of you, Krish. Lovely. And thanks for what you are doing. Really appreciate it. Goodbye to everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, Chris, um, there's one more question in the chat. I think I covered it all. We covered it all. Um, on the screen where you show the compass jellies, on the far left was the Cape compass jelly, and the orange one was found in Namibian waters. Yeah. Can you recap where the one found in the middle and the name of that species. So that one is called Chrysora africana. It's called the African compass jellyfish or the purple compass jellyfish. Common names are, are very, very iffy. And like I said, we only started to start making common names for them a few years ago when the stamp collection came out because all of us were just speaking Latin with like <laughs> giving scientific names here and there. Um, but those are the ones we generally go on. Um, in Namibia, the Benguela compass jellyfish is called um, the red jelly, uh, but uh, I decided to call it the Benguela compass jellyfish because we found some populations even being pushed up to Angola. So it's for, found all along, but it's not found on this side of the coast, basically. As soon as you start getting to Betty's Bay going up, you basically find, start finding the Cape compass jellyfish again on the East Coast and in False Bay. So they, they're very, very much separate. So the one in the middle is very rarely seen, I've only seen photographs. I've seen and worked with the, the animals used for genetic materials, but I've personally not seen Christ order Africana in real life. I would love to. Um, be great if the universe organizes one of my next jelly collection trip. Um, but you've gotten to work with those species of the one, the one on the left and the one on the right, and we know a ton about them. Um, and we can assist, whether it be Kuberg or people of, of the public, um, to try and understand them because we know how long they live, how quickly they grow, how long it takes for them to grow, how long they live. Like we know the basics about them. We know how their little memories work, you know how many baby jellyfish each polyp can give. Um, so all of that information we got to understand by growing them in the lab. Um, and it was a great privilege for me to do that. Um, because like I said, we've, uh, we've had people working on them since 1996. And it was just a, it was just a problem of we were trying to apply um, methodologies used to grow other jellyfish in other parts of the world on our species, which wasn't applicable because our species 
are very much dependent on a warm and cold water. Um, so in the lab, when we grow them, we actually grow them at room temperature, and then we cool them down when we change their water, and that actually stimulates them to grow, besides the fact that we have to feed them a lot of other different things. So it was, it was a great privilege for me to be able to work with them. And yeah, seeing them develop is really, really fantastic. Because I mean, we, you should come visit. They, they're like super small. Um, and you don't think that this little snowflake is going to be even prettier than it is. And then it changes into to that animal and you get to look at that animal for six months and take care of it. It's just magnificent. And the public loves seeing them eat other jellyfish. It's always so strange. They eat other jellyfish. You're like, yeah, it's a circle of life. <laughs> now that's mind blowing. And I think, Ruan, I think we definitely have to take him up and go visit. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll come and knock at your door. But, you know, yeah, but thank you. All good. Then, oh, um, there's um, two more still. There's still two yes, more questions. Andrew, Andrew is first. So let's give Andrew a, a unmute him first. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, thanks so much for the for the video, uh, for the, the presentation. Um, I've just got a question. Um, you said that we have about eight to 10 box jellyfish along our coastline, but only two are described, I think you said was the word. What um, information are you still needing to, like you obviously know there's other species, but when you say you need, you need to still describe the others, what are you still needing to do that description of so, those of the jellies? So when you, when you describe a species for the first time, it's a bit of a process. You need to <laughs> jump through hoops to prove that this is something different, okay? In the past, you could just use what we call morphology. You could look at the length of certain things and the shape of certain things, and you can slice it in half. But in order to do all of those things, you need samples. So you need to collect like 15 or 10 or 20 or 30 of the same animal, okay? Unfortunately, in order to use this animal for science and to, share that, to show that it's actually very different to others. You need to make things called holotypes and prototypes and print types and send them to different museums where they can keep them. So if somebody comes in 10 years time and say, oh, fish was lying to my brain, that's not a different species, they can actually get the material out of, out of formalin or ethanol that they stored in long term and compare it. So somebody, besides seeing the jellyfish even now and then in the ocean, needs to see it frequently. And when they see it, unfortunately, they have to catch it bring it to the aquarium or wherever, we have to then store it in time using formalin or ethanol, which are basically chemicals that petrify, I'm not gonna say petrify, but yeah, keep the jellyfish's shape fairly rigid so that if somebody comes to look at it in 20 years time, it still, it still looks or yeah, it's shaped the same, doesn't lose its shape and generally most of the time not its color. And so then we have to do genetics and measurements. And so it's actually, understanding when these animals will appear um, so you can get enough samples to do it, then to get somebody that's willing to sit hours and hours going through other research papers and comparing this to the 23 other box jellyfish species that's in the world. So it's a very tedious process. Genetics has made it easier for us, um, but jellyfish genetics is also very up in the air because the things we use to sequence the markers of DNA to say that it's a different species, we usually use something called ITS um, and things like that. It's very fickle. One day it works, one day it doesn't work. Um, you have to use universal primers, you sneeze in the lab, you sequence human DNA instead of jellyfish DNA. So it's just very difficult. Um, science is not a very, <laughs> not a very straightforward um, situation. So if you feel that you're dedicated and you love box jellyfish enough, I think Mr. Professor Gibbons will gladly, gladly have you describe box jellyfish for him. Taxonomy is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then Leslie, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you for your uh, uh, question, Andrew. It's a good one. Thank you, and I apologize if it, if it cropped up in the talk, but how, when did jellyfish first evolve, i.e. how long have they been around? Thank you. Ooh. So now you're asking me a good question um, because I can't remember like the exact precambium or whatever period, but jellyfish existed before dinosaurs and fish. Um, if you consult Mr. Google, if you ask him a question, he will tell you that jellies are the oldest animals 
Um, so tenophores are the first group of jelly-like organisms um, that we know of from the fossil record. Um, and under very specific conditions, even though jellyfish are mostly water, if they get squished correctly in the correct mud, you can see an imprint of jellies. So I don't have the exact time period now because I haven't needed to teach any second year students anything in a while. So it's <laughs> not going to come up in 30 seconds or once be a millennia soon. But they are before dinosaurs and they're also technically the first animals with teeth. Because tenophores have modified plates of um, cilia in their mouths. You know, like when you're a kid and you want to draw a dinosaur, when you draw the zigzag triangular teeth, they've got that actually in their mouths that they actually bite and eat each other. Um, so jellies are pre-dinosaur, and I'm sure with either global warming or overfishing, jellies will still be there after fish and everything else as well. So very pretty epic. Job security forever. <laughs> <laughs> I see Maroka said that Krish is in charge of a five-star jelly hotel. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All of the sustenance. <laughs> okay, but I think that's that. Very but well they, answered, they, Krish. They, yes, there was Thank one. You, everybody. There was one more, just a quick one. I'm just looking for it. From Tara McKenney. Uh, are jellyfish sentient? I like to think so even though I don't like to think so because we sacrifice some of them so that their other friends can live. Um, but there is definitely something magical about them. Like the oldest visitor to the aquarium to the youngest visitor of the aquarium literally stands with their mouths aghast going or running jelly. Like I would say if somebody did a social, a social science study in the aquarium, people run towards the jellyfish cylinder as often as they run towards the Nemo cylinder in the aquarium. Um, so there's just, there's definitely something about them. Definitely something about them. Mm. And I what I like so. about them is that they understated and they don't need to throw attention to themselves. They just, they just are where they are. Cool. Well, there's two um, more, sorry, Aisha, uh, uh, okay. from the chat, uh, chat section. When jellyfish used in medicine, is it why that the polyps are all the same? So when we, we don't use the polyps in medicine, we actually use the jellyfish's venom in medicine. So mm -hmm. there's lots of research being done with box jellyfish venom um, to try and help people start and stop their hearts on cue mm -hmm. by chemical means. Um, people also use jellyfish for collagen. Jellyfish are an exceptional good source of collagen um, and stuff like that. And so at the moment, jellyfish corals um, are just being exposed for or their venom and their, and, their, and their venom components to try and find components that can either fight cancers or ease pain or slow or increase or decrease heart rate and things like that. So that's how they use them in medicine. But the polyps are super tiny. I would like, somebody would have to grow like a, a hundred million of them in order to even like use them for anything besides the small. So you think of the picture of the one rand coin according yeah. to the size, they're super tiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. pretty, and pretty. then there's one more. Um... Who's it? Oh, uh, Janet Bodenstein, can jellyfish show the impacts or changes of climate change? Do you think? They can, they can. Mm. I, actually, I actually studied that in my, in my, my masters. Um, and you could actually see that jellyfish, because their body temperature is dependent on the environmental temperature. So as soon as it gets warmer, they digest their food faster. As soon as it gets colder, their food decreases. So we did experiments at the different temperatures along our coastline, and we tried to see how quickly polyps can clone themselves in single individual. And the warmer the water got, the faster they cloned themselves, okay? And then when it was just a drop of two degrees Celsius in temperature, they stressed, freaked out, and made baby jellyfish. <laughs> um, so the warmer the ocean gets, the more polyps there are, the more fruit trees there are, the more fruit trees there are, the more fruit you can get, so like I said, jelly is forever. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, <laughs> will be the dominant species. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, thank you very, very much. That's if there are no other questions, we really did, I think we did all of the questions now in the chat section. If there are any other questions in the audience, please just wave your hand. Or whatnot, but, but I think um, it's that time of the evening where Chris would have said uh, we can unmute everyone and just thank Chris again with a round of applause.
And then if there is anything that anyone wants to say, well, just say hello and thank you. And you are more than welcome to do so. So Marit, if you can un unmute everyone again, we can just give Krish a massive round of applause for an excellent talk. And then, uh, like, like Chris said, um, if you are ever in Cape Town, please do visit the Two Oceans Aquarium. It is an absolutely fascinating place. We had the privilege of filming with Chris and Mareka, the whole team, a few years ago behind the scenes. It was absolutely incredible. I learned so much. But um, really, for everyone who's not been there, you have to go. Absolutely have to go to the Two Oceans Aquarium. It's the best place in the world. Um, yeah. so, oh, thank you very much. And Is you are it... right, Krish. Um, I think every picture I see on Instagram at the aquarium is usually where the jail is. <laughs> like okay. all of them tag the jellies in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. It went across so well. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> Sorry, Marty. If, if I can ask another question, um, of Chris. Yes. In, in, you know, the, you referred to Finding Nemo, and then in Finding Nemo, um, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan of Finding Nemo. It's such a cool movie, but they have that whole jelly forest, you know, where where the um the fish are trying to get through and whatever. I mean, do they literally have um those sorts of um forests or running the gauntlets uh <clears throat> of jellyfish? in the ocean where it's like, you know, kilometers, big congregations of jellyfish. Maybe you can just talk about that, how big they get and... Oh, definitely. So they can span a couple of kilometers. Um, in Namibia, um, I've got pictures and videos of there specifically, just because the winters are strong. So lots of the, the wind aggregates and jellies for like, things like pink oil slicks um, or ludrets basically. But in Cape Town, um, many of my friends do the Robin Island swim. They, they're those brave people. A, they can survive the cold. C, they're not scared of shock. So um, most of them, they like jellyfish and they're happy with jellyfish. But as soon as they swim the Robin Island swim, and there's a wall, a physical wall of compass jellyfish swimming underneath them as they're crossing the ocean, it just transforms their hearts completely. And you just see them pop up in the lab more, and more and more and more. Um, so even in Cape Town, yeah, they, it goes on for, and most of the time it's, it's underneath the water, so you get to see it at the surface, but that also speaks to why some of them get to wash up um, at the end of the season when they're expiring, because just there's just so much of them. So yes, those walls of jellyfish actually do, they do exist. Um, and you'll normally see them um, at the end of November, September, very much so, and now as well um, at the end of summer just because the water gets very warm and then there's a drop in temperature and that's the little polyps of anemones to start making jellies. And then because the photo period is longer, the sun, the, the daylight is longer, more plankton can be made. So more copepods and food for jellies can be made. And so there's just a, a, a large increase of them growing um, in a short period of time um, before they expire and wash up on the beach or return back to the bottom of the ocean. So 